There are many NHL teams in NHL's past that were destined for greatness but fell just short of winning the ultimate prize, the Stanley Cup. Teams like the 85 Flyers, the 2009 Red Wings, and the 2011 Canucks, just to name a few, were teams that looked like they were poised to be racing the cup over their heads, but never did. There are very few teams in NHL history that are remembered if they aren't the ones hoisting Lord Stanley's hardware at the end of the year. One of the most exciting teams built in recent memory to never win the cup was the 2017-18 Winnipeg Jets. This was a team built top to bottom with elite talent such as Blake Wheeler in his prime, Patrick Liney and Kyle Connor both in their sophomore seasons, Big Dustin Bufflin, and Vesna Trophy finalist Connor Hellebuck, just to name a few. This Jets team had little to no flaws, and this was a team that nobody wanted to play against. This is the story of the 2017-2018 Winnipeg Jets, one of the most exciting and fun teams to fall short of being Stanley Cup champions. The 2016-2017 season was a big one for the Winnipeg Jets. After being awarded the number two pick in the 2016 NHL Draft through the draft lottery, they went on to select Finnish sniper Patrick Laine. Finally, Winnipeg had gotten a true star, a true headliner, and boy did Patrick prove to be just that. As the Jets were in the middle of a growth year, Laine showed that he was ready for prime time, putting up 36 goals and 64 points in 73 games. 36 goals is amazing by itself, but as a rookie, absolutely incredible. In addition to Laine, Kyle Connor also got some playing time at the end of the season after dominating in the AHL with the Manitoba Moose that season. The Jets would miss the playoffs that year, however, there was no doubt in the not-so-distant future this could be a very promising team with lots of players ready for the big leagues, and many players just entering their prime. The 2017-2018 season had arrived. Expectations were all over the place when it came to Winnipeg. Were they still growing their prospects and poised to be in the bottom half of the league once again? Or were they ready to take the next step and get back into the playoffs? With the addition of Steve Mason in free agency, it had appeared that Winnipeg had a solid goaltending tandem in Mason and Hellebuck, with Mason expected to get a little bit more of the action. With the season upon them, it was time to see which way the season would go for Winnipeg. In the first game of the season against the Toronto Maple Leafs, Steve Mason made his Jets debut. It went less than ideal, however, for the free agent signing as he let in 5 goals on just 20 shots and was pulled for Connor Hellebuck. Bad luck? First game jitters? Maybe. But the very next game, Mason went on to let in 6 goals on 45 shots in a 6-3 loss to the Calgary Flames. Early on, things were not looking good for the Jets, and their hope that Mason would be able to hold down the fort. The trend of Mason playing poorly would continue as the season went on, as bad game after bad game and injuries piled up for Mason, Connor Hellebuck was given every opportunity to succeed. As quickly as the Jets goalie troubles began, they just as quickly diminished. Hellebuck took the opportunity and ran with it, and went on to start 64 games and win 44 of them, and with a 9-2-4 save percentage. For the first time since relocation, Winnipeg had finally found elite goaltending. The Jets had one of the most stacked defensive units in all of hockey during the 2017-18 season. Returning on the back end was Toby Enstrom and Dustin Bufflin. Enstrom, an underrated defensive defenseman with great puck moving ability. And Big Buff, the big physical freight train that is capable of burying 20 goals from the back end. The second pairing consisted of Jacob Truba and Josh Morrissey. Morrissey, now in his second year, showed that his rookie season was no fluke and they had become a true top four defenseman. Josh continued to be good in his own end and even improved as a puck mover. Truba, who did struggle with injury that season, played in just 55 games. However, Truba was able to have another strong season defensively and still put up 24 points and contributing to the power play at times. Having the luxury of Tyler Myers in his prime on the third pairing certainly didn't hurt the Jets either. Myers was able to step into the top four seamlessly when injuries arose, even playing some of his best hockey in the top four. Rounding out the six and seven spots were Ben Sherratt and Dmitry Kulikov, two shutdown defensemen capable of stepping into top four and penalty killing roles when needed. This defense was truly elite and a big part of the Jets' success that season. Up front, the Jets had one of the most solid and complete four forward lines in the NHL. Mark Shifley continued to be Mr. Consistent, putting up 60 points in 60 games, and Blake Wheeler showed that he was one of the most underrated players in the league at the time, showing his playmaking ability alongside of Mark Shifley and Kyle Connor for the bulk of the year. 
Wheeler finished the year with 68 assists and 91 points, setting a career high in both categories. Kyle Connor benefited from playing with Wheeler in a big way, putting up his first 30-goal campaign of his young career. Going down the lineup was an elite supporting cast consisting of Nikolai Ehlers and sophomore season Patrick Laine. Patrick Laine was one of the most fun players to watch on the ice every single night. Patrick improved in the goal department, scoring 8 more goals than he did a year ago as he had 44 and finished with 70 points. For almost the entire year, Laine was right in line for the Rocket Richard Trophy but ended up losing the race to Alex Ovechkin. Ehlers continued to show off his elite speed and playmaking ability, opening up a lot of room for the famous Line A one-timers. With so much speed and skill, when these guys were on their game, there was no stopping them. The third line consisted of Andrew Cobb, Adam Lowry, and Brandon Tanev. This line was Winnipeg's true shutdown line, playing big minutes against the other team's best. Tanev was a pleasant surprise and turned out to be one of the Jets' best defensive players. He quickly became a fan favorite for his tenacious speed and always giving 100% in the corners. Brian Little, Matthew Perot, Matt Hendricks, and Yuel Armia rounded out the forward core, each bringing strong defensive play and a hint of scoring touch. Fast forward close to the NHL trade deadline and Winnipeg is winning games and they are one of the best teams in the NHL 5-on-5. Five five. Everything seemed to be clicking for the Jets and they were looking to upgrade. In late February, Winnipeg added a massive piece to their top six, Paul Stastny. Paul came in between Line A and Ehlers and had instant chemistry with the two. While Line A and Ehlers played great with Brian Little in the middle, at times it was noticeable that the Jets could upgrade for the 2C spot. In 19 games with the Jets before the playoffs, Stastny put up 13 points. Paul turned out to be everything and more that the Jets hoped he would be, fitting perfectly in the lineup. With other additions, such as trading for defenseman Joe Morrow and Jack Roslevic being called up from the Moose, the Jets were one of the scariest teams heading into the playoffs. Lots of big games and big moments from players up and down the depth chart was a big reason the Jets were as successful as they were that year. It seemed like every night, someone was having a statement game. Whether it was one of Patrick Laine's hat-trick games, a big Connor Hullabuck shutout, or Dustin Bufflin taking over the game, there was always a player leading the way regardless of their role in the lineup. This was something that Winnipeg hadn't had in the past, a true team effort night in and night out. Winnipeg had a dramatic improvement in all major statistical categories from just a season ago. In the 2016-17 season, the Jets finished with just 87 points and missed the playoffs with 246 goals for and 255 goals against. The new and improved Jets shattered those marks and finished the season with 114 points and their first 50-win season in Jets 2.0 history. A big reason for the jump in success was because the Jets were finally playing a complete team game. Night in, night out, it was always a team effort and it never looked like just one line was carrying the team. Everybody was consistently putting out every night. They scored 273 goals and just 216 goals against. There was also a dramatic improvement in special teams from just a season ago. The Jets finished the year with a 23.4 power play percentage and an 81.4 penalty kill percentage. Dramatic increases in both areas from just one season removed from being 18.2% on the power play and an ugly 77.5% on the penalty kill. With big time improvement in all areas, the Winnipeg Jets were firing on all cylinders and winning a lot of games. They couldn't wait to get back into the playoffs and win their first playoff game since returning to Winnipeg in 2011. The Jets finished second in the Central, just three points behind P.K. Subban and the Nashville Predators. Their first opponents were the Minnesota Wild. The Wild were no slouch, however, right from the beginning the Jets were heavy favorites with a much deeper team top to bottom. April 11, 2018 was the return of the Winnipeg Whiteout. The Jets dominated much of Game 1, however sat tied 2-2 in the third period. With 7-13 remaining in the game, Joe Morrow blasted a shot from the blue line that went right through Devin Dubnik to take the lead at 3-2. This goal would ultimately lock this one up and Winnipeg would be victorious. And there it is, Winnipeg's first playoff win since relocation. A big day for the Jets, and an even bigger day for the fans that stuck by this team since they had left in 1996. The Jets continued their dominance in Game 2, but stumbled in Game 3, losing 6-2. Although, the young goaltender, Connor Hellebuck, took the series into his own hands in Game 4 and 5 and completely slammed the door on the Wild, posting back-to-back -back shutouts, 2-0 and 5-0 in their games respectively. Winnipeg won the series in five games and would now move on to the second round. 
This was Winnipeg's first series win since relocation. This series win was big for not only the players and the team, but for the fans as well. With the product that was being put on the ice every night, Jets fans had more confidence in their team than ever before. Knocking down the barriers of winning a playoff game and a playoff series, it was like a big weight had been lifted off not only the team, but the city in general. In round two, the Jets would go up against the Nashville Predators. The Preds were led by defenseman P.K. Subban, who had finished third in Norris voting, putting up 59 points with 16 goals that year. Not only was P.K. having a great year, but so was Pekka Rinne. Rinne won the Vesna Trophy, and he was the only goalie to get more Vesna votes than goaltender Connor Hellebuck. Rinne finished that season with a 9.27 save percentage and a .231 goals against average. And on top of all that, he also posted 8 shutouts in the regular season. The Jets were going to have their hands full with the Central Division winners, but they were up for the fight. But they were going to have to do something that few teams were able to do all season long. Solve Pecorine. This series was a back and forth affair. The Jets came out on the road in Nashville and delivered a statement game, winning by the score of 4-1. The Jets came in as underdogs, and this was a big one for them. Mark Shifley stayed hot in that game, scoring two more goals, including an empty netter, to clamp down Game 1. This showed the entire NHL, along with the fans back at home, that the Wild Series was no fluke. The Jets were here to play. In Game 2, it was an all-out war, with the Predators taking a 4-3 lead with just 14-15 remaining in the third period. However, Mark Shifley came in clutch late to tie the game with just over a minute to go. The celebration was held short, however, as in double overtime, Kevin Fiala scored to tie the series at 1. In Game 3, they flew back to Winnipeg. The whiteout was silenced fast, however, as the Predators took a 3-0 lead at the end of the first period. But in the second period, the Jets came out firing. Paul Stastny scored to make it 3-1, and less than two minutes later, Dustin Bufflin got the Jets back into it to make it 3-2. But just when you thought it couldn't get any louder in Bell MTS place, just 18 seconds later, Patrick Liney sent a perfect pass across the ice to Jacob Truba to tie the game. The building erupted into white noise. You just knew that there was no way Winnipeg was going to lose this game after that. Bufflin scored near the end of the second period to take the lead heading into the third. It was pandemonium in Winnipeg. Midway through the third, Nashville would tie it and silence the crowd but it would be Captain Blake Wheeler burying his second and third of the postseason to seal the deal. Winnipeg wins 7-4. This was one of the most memorable games in Winnipeg Jets history. A roller coaster ride of being down 3 to nothing, and then seeing Dustin Bufflin doing a jig when they take the lead 4-3. This is one Jets fans will never forget. The two teams traded wins back and forth until the Predators forced a Game 7 back at home in Nashville, Tennessee. The Preds were slight favorites, but it was the Jets who showed up this night. Defenseman Tyler Myers and Paul Stastny scored two peculiar goals on Vesna winning goaltender Pecorine early on in the first period, and he was pulled. The Jets had come in and in the first 10 minutes completely sucked all of the excitement and error out of all the fans in Nashville. Paul Stastny and Mark Shifley shined in this game, each scoring two goals en route to win Game 7 5-1 and propelled the Jets to their first ever Western Conference Final. This win turned a lot of heads, and a lot of people started to take the Jets seriously. This was a game and a day that many Jets fans look on fondly as a great memory in franchise history. Unfortunately, it would become the highest of highs for a little while. In the third round, the Jets were faced with the expansion team, the Vegas Golden Knights, who above all odds had strong-armed themselves through two rounds. Anchored by Marc-Andre Fleury, the Knights really had no pressure as they were an expansion team with no expectations. The Jets, who were heavy favorites, went on to dominate Game 1 and take a 1-0 series lead. Lots of people had already written off the series as an easy Jets win, even a tune-up series if you will. After Game 1, many had the Jets penciled in to be playing in the Stanley Cup Final. Although, after Game 1, it seemed that the Jets had run out of gas. They weren't the same team, and the Knights dominated the next four games. The Golden Knights would win this series in five games and effectively end the Jets and the fans' dreams of being Stanley Cup champions. Whether you want to blame it on inexperience, fatigue from the Nashville series, or even a bit of both, the Winnipeg Jets season was over and it felt like a lot was left on the table. However, even though this elimination stung a bit for the Jets, they still had a strong young core and many players still in their prime. They'd be expected to be right back next year and maybe even stronger than the season before. 
Expectations were sky high for the Jets after that season, and they were never really able to truly live up to them. The next season, they started off great, but fell apart after the Christmas break, desperately missing Paul Stastny, who had signed with Vegas in the offseason. The Jets would lose in the first round to the eventual Stanley Cup champions, the St. Louis Blues that year, and were eliminated far sooner than anyone would have expected to start the 2018-19 season. More departures would hit Winnipeg in the following years, such as Jacob Truba being traded to the Rangers, Ben Sherratt and Tyler Myers hitting for agency, and Dustin Bufflin retiring out of the blue. The Jets had a hard time recovering from the loss of most of their defensive core, and relied on Connor Hellebuck to steal games for a large portion of the next couple of seasons. However, maybe the most noteworthy departure was the young Finnish sniper, Patrick Laine, who was dealt to the Columbus Blue Jackets at the beginning of the 2020-2021 season. When Laine was drafted second overall, it sent fans back in time to the 90s, unlocking old memories of the Finnish Flash team of Solane. It wasn't supposed to end the way it did in Winnipeg for Patrick, and it was a tough day for the fans as the news broke when he had been traded along with Jack Rosovic for Pierre-Luc Dubois. The Jets were now very different from how they looked since being eliminated by Vegas, with some players regressing, players wanting out, and poor coaching decisions. The Jets just haven't been able to recapture the magic of the 2018 season. This was the first year that the Jets had finally put together a real solid team that was able to make noise in the playoffs and getting the Jets 2.0's first playoff and series win of its short history. That season meant a ton to the fans. After a long time without the Jets, after being relocated to Phoenix in the 90s, watching the quality of the product on ice was a lot of fun. To the records broken, new fan favorites, franchise players emerging, and the many many street parties at Portage and Maine, this was an incredible season for Winnipeg. The only thing missing was a Stanley Cup parade.